And I'm going to hand over now to our chair for this evening, uh, the legendary birder and field worker, Mike Smart, who also happens to be on the Curlew Action Board of Trustees. And Mike has a huge amount of experience working with curlews in the field. So it's going to be a really, really interesting discussion. So over to you, Mike. Mike, I think you're on mute. Good evening, everybody. Can I hope you can hear me now. Um, <clears throat> as Ellen says, I've been working with curlews for a long time. For the last 20 years, mainly in uh, the southwest of England, Gloucestershire and Worcestershire in the Severn and Avon Vales. And I'm currently <clears throat> working with the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust uh, Seven and Avon Vale Curlew project, which looks at breeding curlews in flood meadows. Uh, I'm a trustee of Curlew uh, Action, um, and uh, obviously uh, with the involvement um, in Gloucestershire and Worcestershire uh, along the Seven and Avon, we have very close links with the farmers. Uh, our, um, our curlews nest mostly in hay meadows where there's a very late hay cut, hay cut and in almost everywhere else round about there are no curlews left because of more intensive farming and we obviously need to find some sort of balance uh, between maintaining the curlews and allowing the car the farmers to make their make their hay silage is clearly a big problem because it cuts uh, several times a year and risks um, causing damage to not just to curlews but to any ground nesting birds. So we have an impressive panel uh, to discuss this subject this evening. Uh, Russ Wynn has been working for a long time in the field on new forest curlews and for the last couple of years has been the manager of Curlew Recovery, uh, the Curlew Recovery Partnership England, which um, deals uh, with all kinds of curlew issues and brings together the major NGOs from whatever point of view uh, who are working on curlews, but not just the NGOs because it works, it, it was originally set up by DEFRA to provide advice on curlew um, recovery. Uh, so Russ has not merely practical knowledge, but an overview of the policy issues, which is why we, we've we asked him to speak first. After him comes John Turner, who's a Lincolnshire farmer, very much involved in um, pasture-fed uh, uh, cultivation of, of grassland. And finally, the uh, the really legendary Mandy Perkins, uh, who for a very long time has been leading the fantastic Curlew Country project in Shropshire, where, which is practically dealing with uh, cur curlews trying to nest in a silage making uh, part of the country. So well, there will be presentations from the, th uh, the, the three panelists. Afterwards, we are going to throw it open to the um, to discussion and to questions. Uh, so without more ado, I invite Russ uh, to introduce the topic uh, straight away. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, Mike. That's great. And uh, Ellen, if you could flash the uh, first slide up, please, that'd be fantastic. <clears throat> While Ellen's doing that, as Mike mentioned, I'm manager of England's Curly Recovery Partnership. And uh, Silage is, is but one of many um, issues that um, that we're, we're dealing with at the minute. The Curlew Recovery Partnership, where nine organisations, uh, hopefully, as you can see from the screen there, uh, a broad spread of, of, of representation, big major sort of national NGOs, smaller curlew specific NGOs, Natural England on the, uh, the sort of policy side and a couple of major land owning interests um, in there as, as well. And we've got a wider network of over 350 members. Uh, and I'll put up a, a contact at the end if you'd like to uh, to be part of that network. And the aim is very simple, try and reverse the decline of, of curlews, bring curly conservationists together, um, and importantly, sort of bring together the evidence base that, that underpins a lot of uh, curly conservation. So next slide, please. 
Apologies if you've seen this one before, but I think it's important for those that, that haven't and to refresh those that have is to, to put what we're talking about in context. So we hold a quarter of the global breeding population of Eurasian curlew. So that's really significant, this international responsibility that we have for the species. Um, current estimate is 58,500 breeding pairs in the UK. Roughly about half of those are thought to occur in England. Uh, but there's big error bars around those those figures. Some of those uh, data that these figures are based upon are quite quite old. We've got higher confidence that we only have about 500 pairs in England south of the Pennine chain. And if you look at the map on the left, which is breeding relative abundance of curlew from the last atlas, the BTO atlas, you see is that wedge of dark coloration, dark red in the Pennine chain, which is where we've got the highest abundance in in the UK, uh, certainly in England. But south of that dogleg black line, which includes all of the island of Ireland, all of Wales and all of southern England, um, south of the Pennines, we think there's possibly as few as 2000 pairs remaining. And in most of that area, they're still declining uh, and not doing very well at all. So there is a risk that in the coming decades, we could lose them from about half of the UK and Irish range. So as well as trying to maintain the population, we're trying to maintain the, the distribution. Uh, the population has halved in the last two decades, which is why it's such a, a conservation priority. We know from work done by the BTO and others that the adult survival over the winter from year to year is good. Um, it's more than 90 percent for, for adult birds, which is, is pretty good. So it's not issues outside of the breeding uh, period that seem to be affecting them. It's not adult survival. But we do know that their productivity, their ability to, to raise chicks is poor. Uh, and it's down at about 0.25 chicks per pair per year, which is the sort of metric that we, we use. Uh, and it needs to be at least double that for a stable population. So we're basically not getting enough chicks out of the end of the pipeline for a sustainable population across the country. And um, Graham Appleton that, that uh, leads the Fantastic Way Details blog uh, did a back of the envelope and estimated we need 10,000 more chicks per year in the UK for a stable curlew population. So that figure really focuses the mind on the fact that we need national scale uh, solutions. A little bit of work here and there at a local or even a regional level isn't going to generate those 10,000 chicks. It needs to be national national action. OK, next slide. So uh, this one is uh, a slide that I put together, has a big health warning on it. There's big error bars around some of these things, more data urgently needed, but I think it helps frame uh, the discussion quite nicely. So on the left uh, is the productivity uh, from zero at the bottom to one at the top. Uh, and along the bottom is habitat quality or heterogeneity um, from a curlew's perspective, from poor on the left to, to good on the right. And uh, on the right is uh, the level of predator control in, in different landscapes from none at the bottom to high at the top. And the black dashed line across the middle is that 0.5 uh, chicks per pair per year that we need for a stable population. The red dashed line is where we are at the minute and a diagonal black line with the arrow at the end is the curve that we want to go on for curlew recovery. And if we overprint the habitats that curlew like to breed in in England and the wider UK and Ireland, we can see that grouse moors where you've got pretty decent habitat for, for curlews and, and many other breeding waders and high levels of, of predator management are where productivity tends to be highest uh, and we have you know, high, high confidence in that. The only other places where we have sustainable populations generally are on nature reserves where the habitat is tightly managed and there's some level of predator control, whether that's non-lethal like exclusion fencing or, or lethal control. Most other habitats we think overall are below threshold, so whether it's upland moorland in by farmland, they're pretty good uh, and, and good opportunities in those habitats for, for you know, gen contributing to that 10,000 chicks figure. Interestingly, in southern England, the birds are mostly on hay, silage and lowland heath. And these are the habitats where the productivity tends to be lowest around 0.1 to 0.2 chicks per pair per year and where we need to focus effort if we really want to maintain uh, the species in, in some of those areas. So I think I think this shows that you know silage fields, and I'll talk about why curlews nest in it, in terms of productivity and the overall requirements of the chicks and the adults during the breeding season, it comes pretty low 
uh, from a curlew's perspective. And in many of these agricultural landscapes, particularly intensive agricultural landscapes, um, there's not uh, a significant level of predator control um, either. OK, next slide, please. So if we focus on silage, why do curlews nest in silage? Um, one of the primary reasons is, is that the sward length is at the right height at the right time of year for them to nest in. They like to have uh, a sward height where they can be sitting on the nest and, and they can just about see um, over the top. So in a landscape, silage provides about the right sort of conditions for them um, to nest. That's a decision based on uh, sort of protection of the nest, visibility of the nest, rather than around the food resources that, that might be available and, and other things. So that's one of the main reasons why they nest in, in, in silage. When do they nest? So at this time of year, many of you uh, where you're in areas with curlews may have noticed them coming back uh, in recent days. So they start coming back on territory uh, through March, sometimes as early as February, sometimes into April. And generally they'll start nesting in the second half of April uh, into early May. And then they're on the nest for around four uh, to five weeks. After that, uh, you'll start to see the first uh, chicks arriving in late May, early June. And then it's another sort of five or six weeks before those birds are, are ready to fledge. Uh, so you're looking well into July. And in some cases where a pair may have failed early on, the eggs may have been taken early on, uh, they'll have another go. Uh, and in that case, if they are successful, the chicks may not be appearing until uh, quite a way into August. And that obviously is very relevant to the um, uh, silage issues I'll talk about in a minute. So that's that's when they nest. And generally, once they've finished nesting uh, and the chicks are fledged or they failed, they'll leave uh, and return back to, to coastal sites where they spend the winter. What do they eat? Mostly invertebrates. Uh, they're not particularly choosy. They'll eat a range of invertebrates here in the New Forest. I've seen them eating lizards. Uh, in summer on the heathlands and in winter down at the coast, they eat things like crabs, quite big crabs. Um, so they have quite a broad diet, but generally during the breeding season, they need a lot of invertebrates. And the chicks also um, uh, can feed themselves pretty much straight out of the egg and they pick at small invertebrates as well. So having lots of invertebrates for them to eat uh, and to have available to them is key. Why do they fail? Well, you can see from that nesting schedule that anything that involves cutting prior to uh, certainly mid-July uh, is likely to destroy eggs or chicks. Um, unfortunately, the chicks tend to hunker down uh, when they're threatened, uh, and that's not a great strategy if there's a, a tractor uh, with a mower on it or a combine harvester or whatever you know, coming towards you. So, so direct loss of eggs and chicks is, is one reason. Um, Nesting in silage fields, if we get damp weather when the chicks are quite young, uh, it's quite hard for the chicks to move through that kind of uh, habitat and they can get wet and chilled quite easily. And they're often quite poor in terms of food resource for the for the chicks as well. So if you've got quite a homogeneous silage landscape, uh, even if cutting is, is late enough that the chicks can hatch, um, it's often not the most, most productive um, for them. And then we've got this issue about predators. Um, generally, it's losses to agricultural operations like grass cutting and predation that are the two major blocks on productivity in England. And the two things sometimes uh, are um, working in tandem. So again, if you've got a silage dominated landscape or even an individual field, it, cut, it gets cut very quickly uh, with modern machinery. And even if the chicks evade uh, the cut, then they're left exposed uh, in a very um, open landscape that then tips the advantage towards particularly avian predators like corvids and um, birds of prey. So, so predation generally is pretty high. We've got a lot of foxes and corvids in the landscape, um, some of the highest uh, densities in Europe. Um, but this interplay of, of cropping operations and predators is, is a really important one as well because you can mitigate the cropping, but if you're not able to then mitigate the increased predation risk, um, you're not going to be able to get your productivity up where it where it needs to be for a sustainable population. And then just to note on other biodiversity, um, uh, yeah, I think if you look at other waders, things like skylarks, uh, etc., you know, intensively managed silage um, fields are not the best for other biodiversity as well, and that includes um, invertebrates. So, and not all silage is equal, and not all fields are equal, and there'll be a, a spectrum of things. 
but but certainly yeah a lot of the intense um sort of silage agriculture is not very good for other biodiversity as well and again that has impl implications for things like chick foraging um success so next slide so how do we tackle this well one of the first things we've been doing under the crp uh, since we were initiated a couple of years ago is, is really just getting the word out about what the issues are. A, you know, the curlew's in trouble, and it's not just in this country, across the world. Curlews are a, a, a species group that is not faring uh, very well at all. A couple have become extinct in, in recent decades. So it's raising awareness in this country that we've got lots of curlews. That's great, but that doesn't mean they're doing well. They're actually declining rapidly, and if it keeps going, we're not going to have many curlews in future. And that the public and, and farmers and other, others in the community um, are going to have to play a key role if we're going to turn it around for, for curlew. So, so you know, things like mitigating recreational disturbance, um, et cetera, are going to be key. And Mandy might talk about Curlew Can, which has been a great initiative with, with Curlew Country. Again, a good way of getting across the issues that curlews face, particularly when they're, they're nesting. Next slide. But in terms of tackling the silage issue, it's really going to be policy and agri-environment policy specifically that's going to be the way in which we uh, address this. And it, and it, and it you know, may be feasible in some areas, it may not in others, but we need to we need to work out ways of at least testing it. So uh, Mary and myself and other members of the CRP have been on the road meeting uh, farmers and, and other members of our network, but also trying to meet with policymakers. And we found it quite hard, as I think many have, to engage uh, significantly with DEFRA over the last couple of years while they've been busy um, flip-flopping around with, with the Environmental Land Management Programme um, and, and similar initiatives. We've had more success engaging with Natural England. Uh, we've met with the Chief Executive Tony Juniper, who's pictured here, um, and um, that's been very fruitful. And we've got good engagement with, with Natural England staff. So, so we're doing what we can to um, engage on the policy side and get across the things that curly need to be successful. And we've submitted recently, and we're we're on the fledge of getting a formal uh, uh, um, approval, uh, a 700,000 pound um, species recovery program bid over the next two years. Um, and I'll just take the, the quote um, from the bid text here at the top. So, Whilst curly populations are highest along the Pennine chain, the CRP proposes that the greatest potential to recover populations at landscape scale is by increasing curly productivity in farm landscapes, particularly those dominated by improved and semi-improved grassland where agricultural operations and predation are the main threats, and that national scale agri-environment schemes are the only viable delivery mechanism. The aim of this proposed species recovery program is therefore to trial several interventions that have high potential to address the key drivers of low productivity, specifically increasing hatching and fledging success during the breeding period and to inform future agri-environment measures. So the, the three things we're going to trial under this program uh, to deliver that are nest fencing to improve hatching rates, uh, so protecting either at nest or at part of a field level, um, grass cutting sacrifice options at both nest and field level to improve hatching and, and fledging rates and habitat, habitat creation options to um, uh, also improve fledging rates, such as leaving margins or corners of fields uncut or having um, herbal rich lays. It wasn't feasible within the scope of the funding and the project to deliver um, lethal predator control at the scale that would have made a difference over two years, the next two years, this spring and, and next spring. But we will be collecting indices of, of predator pressure and we'll also be um, looking at the farmer responses to the proposed interventions, particularly the proposed payment levels um, and the outcomes. Um, obviously, we're, we're you know, uh, aware that this may not work in all areas, and if it doesn't work, do we do we uh, you know see disillusionment and, and and farmers not wanting to engage going going forwards? So so we try to um, really focus in on where the issues are, and the areas that we're going to be working on are the Yorkshire Dales, particularly the valley floors where there is a lot of um, uh, silage cropping, um, Breckland where there's a more mixed agricultural landscape, um, and in lowland southern England we're going to be focusing on the Upper Thames. Um, the Seven and Avon Vales, where where Mike hails from, and Curly Country, where you'll you'll hear about more um, from Mandy in the future. 
So fingers crossed that this gets uh, the final seal of approval to get funded and we can start work on it next spring. And obviously the outcomes we'll be sharing um, with the, the community as, as soon as possible. And then the only thing I was just going to mention is that on the Curly Recovery Partnership website, uh, if you look on the blog, uh, I think a couple of springs ago, we did a specific blog on curlews and silage, which includes some um, tips and things to try and increase uh, productivity of curlews in that specific environment. And final slide. Uh, so feel free to email me if you want to join the network and you haven't already. So it's a monthly newsletter, not loads of spam, uh, but but you know um, alerting people to resources that might be might be valuable. And go and take a look at the website. If you're interested in surveying curlews on your land, um, then we've also got a lot of information and resources to support you um, doing that because understanding where uh, your curlews are breeding on your land and how many there are, as well as other waders, is often the first you know, really vital piece of information you need before you can then start uh, thinking about how best to, to protect them. OK, thanks, uh, Ellen, for doing that. And uh, Mike, back over to you. Thanks very much, Russ. And I'm sure you'll have noticed that the whole approach uh, of CRP and indeed of the Curlew conservation community is to work with farmers to try and find solutions. Uh, we're, we're, we're not on a some sort of campaign against, against silage, just trying to work around uh, and find the compromise that can allow farming to go ahead, but at the same time without destroying curlews. Um, I'd suggest if anybody's got any questions, either put them on the chat or save them up till afterwards. I think we'd rather go straight on to uh, John uh, Turner's presentation, uh, and he's a, a practical farmer dealing with it every day. So over to you, John. Thanks very much indeed. We're going to have a go at trying to share this, and if it works, that's all good. And if it doesn't, we're going to be back to Ellen. So. Uh, can you see that? Are we um, have we got a curlews and silage? Is that what you guys are seeing? I can't see it. Uh -huh. Let's just have one very quick go. Uh, thank you. So uh, share and mm -hmm. any success with that at all or not? No, I still can't right. see it. Do you want me to share We're my going screen? to go into plan B then. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you very screen. much. So, um, and I'll just give you a nudge if that's all right. Uh, just close the share tray. There we go. Ah, oh, thank you for that. So, when we're ready to start. So, yes, John Turner, um, have the next. Ooh, that's sorry, very sorry. quick. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you could have the first slide, please. Um, yeah, Is next one, please. <clears throat> oh, sorry. So um, what I'm going to do, we're going to have a quick run through, um, quick introduction to us as a farm, um, a little bit about conserved forage, um, you know, what its role is, uh, particularly within livestock farming, what it involves. Um, we're going to talk maybe about some of the, the trade-offs that we um, sort of have to work with on a daily basis as farmers that... Um, you know, there's always compromises and there's always decisions to be made. And it's it's where the actual balance finally um, lies that we have to deal with. Um, and that's really where the scope for change is that um, both the sort of Mike and Russ have talked about. Um, it's it's shifting the balance um, and sometimes quite small changes can have quite a big effect. So, um, yeah. I think farmers are very open to, um, you know, doing whatever they can to support initiatives like this. And it's just working through the practical um, ways of actually achieving that. Um, so, yeah, if you could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> so we farm just north of Stamford in Lincolnshire. We're a mixed rotational farm and by mixed and rotational, mixed in that we have livestock and arable. Um, and rotational in that the, the, we've got some permanent um, grassland, some, some fields that have been down for grass for a long time. The rest moves around the farm, so we would have about three years in cereals, grain, wheat and um, peas and oats and that sort of thing, and then it'll be followed by three years of a grass lay. 
and uh, we've been organic since 1999 and sort of as well as that, we've been involved in working with NGO groups, um, going back sort of Friends of the Earth in uh, the early 2000s, um, sort of we're, you know, in regular contact with Sustain and sort of groups like that. And out of that, we try and bridge, um, in a lot of respects, that gap between the aspirational, where we want to go with policy, we try and tie that in with our practical farming experience and try and find, you know, ways of marrying the two up. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Alan. Thank you. So on the farm that I, I mentioned, we've got livestock and we now work with Ahimsa, which are a slaughter fit free micro dairy run by the Hare Krishna community. And um, that's sort of quite an inspiring model of livestock. Very extensive and very small scale um, but the value of what they're doing is, is sort of quite significant so that's been quite an exciting uh, recent department for us or departure for us um, before that uh, we from 1960s to the early 2000s we were what i would describe ourselves as a commercial dairy farm uh, with british regions um, and when the uh, we actually went into organic conversion in 1999, um, by 2004, the bottom had fallen out the organic market for milk. And we found ourselves on the brink of um, uh, so sort of going into bankruptcy, really. So we had to do some quick changes. We went into beef suckler herd. Um, so we were beef suckler herd from early 2000s to 2019, which is when we went to, um, you know, developments partnership with Ahimsa. So we've always had livestock on the farm. They've always been cattle and we've got a long history going back to the early days of cows with all sorts of conserved forage, whether that's hay, uh, silage or haylage. We also do wheat and grains, which we now concentrate on for the specialist grains for artisan bakers. We do peas um, for a lovely firm in Suffolk called Hodmadod. And since uh, the early sort of, um, well, 2009, we actually started Pasture for Life, but that was an initiative which tries to um, extol the virtues of ruminant animals being fed entirely off grazed forage so it came out of a number of things but sort of a, an awareness of the pressure on things like soya from the brazilian um you know, or the amazon basin anyway um the pressure on farmland in the uk the fact that around the world we're using about two-thirds of our arable land for producing uh, feed for animals, which is actually not a very efficient use of land, um, and it can have all sorts of impacts. So Pasture for Life Standards is probably one of the few um, um, sort of very clearly defined ways of rearing livestock on pasture, and there's quite a lot of environmental benefits for that. So I'm going to cover that a little bit later on. Next slide, please. Thank you. So conserved forage and its role on the farm. We, um, although we're in a low, low rainfall area, we only have about 450 mils of rain a year. Um, and it all seems to come at the wrong time for us. But um, nevertheless, even though we've got sort of quite dry land, we do bring the animals in over winter. And that's for the health of the animals. And it's for the health of the soil as well. So we've got about 180 days when these animals are inside and they need a diet that is as good, hopefully, as when they're out grazing the fields. Um, so these are, are sort of on a, a these particular this particular picture is some some, um, some young animals on a mixture of straw, which is the residue from the cereal crops, of course. Um, and this is some haylage, which is somewhere between silage and hay. It's um, sort of quite a high dry matter uh, conserved thing. But the important thing for is, is the, yeah, it's the quality of that conserved forage, because what we um, put into store in sort of May, June, July and August, um, September in the run up to um, the autumn, really defines the productivity of those animals going right through from 
um, early November right through to probably early April. And if we get it wrong, that can have a big impact on the, um, you know, if you were milking, it has a, a huge impact on milk. Um, and, and certainly in our dairy days, if we went from, let's say, one batch of silage to another, and there was a difference in the quality, that would be reflected in the milk production the very next day. And if you get it wrong, it takes a long while to get it back. So um, when you're making sort of fractions of a pence a litre um, on as, as a profit, those sorts of very small changes can have a big effect. And quantities, of course, the other thing, um, you've got a lot of stomachs to feed for 180 days. And, um, you know, even on our sort of quite modest farm, we would be looking at putting 350 tonnes of, of silage um, uh, in store for the winter months. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So the, <clears throat> the two conserved um, sort of forages, uh, they may be obvious, so apologies if I'm, I'm sort of stating the obvious, but um, hay is um, desiccated dried grass, and it's typically 80 to 85 percent um, uh, sort of dry matter. Typically, it's um, as, as both Mike and Russ have said, it's typically started a little bit later than silage um, and would be in June. And one of one of the reasons for that from a practical point of view is you, you need about a weather window of about five days to make grass. And if you think about cutting your lawn, if you don't have a grass box on a mower and you cut it, um, if it's a nice warm day and the, you know there's a good drying breeze, that will probably dry to something approximating to hay in a very short time, probably in a day or something like that. In terms of field crops, um, you, there's less leaf. You, you've probably got a little bit more stem, and it's the stem that takes a little bit more drying out. And if you were to go and bale the crop, the crop before it was fully dried out, that's when you get a lot of mould um, developing. Um, and when the cattle come to eat that, A, it's not very palatable, and B, the mould can actually give them, um, cause some fairly serious respiratory um, problems. And there's a real risk there that you could cut, you know, with the best will in the world, you, you look at the weather forecast, but you can cut planning to make hay. And if you're four days in and just about to bale it, it's not quite ready and you get a, um, a shower, that can knock things back by another two or three days. And all the time you're leaching out nutrients and the quality is going down. So if we could have the next uh the next slide, please. Hence the uh, increasing popularity of silage, um, which I think from a farming point of view, I, I suppose it's a lot quicker and easier. Um, it, sometimes the quality actually isn't as good as hay. I think if we, in an ideal world, we would make all hay. Um, there's, uh, as you can see from the photo, there's a lot of plastic used in silage. Um, this is one method, which is to make round bales and wrap them up with something that approximates to cling film. Um, the other one is to put it in a big clamp and put a sheet over it. But both of them, you're trying, you're, you're effectively pickling the grass rather than uh, desiccating it and drying it out. And by pickling it, um, the idea is that um, you cut it you get it to this 30 to 35% dry matter as quickly as you can. Um, and then once it's at that dry matter, it's wrapped up and you seal the, um, you know, keep the oxygen out of it. It will use the oxygen that's in the bale, but once that's used up, it effectively preserves it as um, in a pickling action. Typically May onwards, um, certainly in our part of the country, it's mid-May onwards, although I've heard Mike say down in Somerset, you know, as, as, as early as late April or early May. And typically people will take a cut of silage at six week intervals. So if you're taking your first one mid-May, your second cut could be towards the end of June and then maybe a third cut um, towards the end of July, beginning of August. Um, with diminishing, decreasing amounts of, uh, of yield. And certainly the important thing is the first cut um, in terms of volume. And if you've got a big dairy herd, what you're trying to do is fill the clamps up and know that you're going to be able to feed your animals over winter. 
Um, the weather window required is actually a lot shorter, three days, probably even two days for a lot of people. And if, if it does happen to, to rain on it, it's not the end of the world. Um, it won't wreck the crop in the way that, um, you know, a hay crop might get damaged. Uh, next one, please. So just some of the quick, uh, quick run through some of the operations. Um, this is mowing. Um, there's also uh, following the mower will be a tedder, which sort of fluffs up the um, uh, the grass and gets the air through it and gets it drying quickly. After tedding and it's spread, um, there'll be a raking operation to put it into windrows. Um, and then there is either a baler coming in, baling and wrapping, or you put it into a trailer, which is taken back to the farm and into the, the clamp. But all of these mean machinery going into fields um, and in particular, the mowing is the one highlighted in red there that causes most of the damage. That's where we see the real impact. Um, next one, please. So in terms of us and our own experience, the collateral damage, um, um, rabbits, obviously, um, mice involves a fair bit. Um, some of them actually do get, um, you know, get cut up a little bit with the, um, you know, with the mower, but some of them, it, it's just removing, um, you know, a very safe canopy. Um, what we, that bottom corner um, in the left-hand corner at the bottom is a red kite there, which would, I took that picture from the, the, the cab of the tractor last year. And we were in a field and at one point I, covered, I counted 23 red kites, which were circling around. And I remember when I was young, we used to have sort of seagulls behind the, the tractor when we were ploughing. These days, it's more a question of having this flock of red kites when we're silaging. And they were there. You can see them diving down and picking up these mice. The mice will be sort of scurrying, scurrying away or voles. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a feast for the, um, for the kites. So it's not that the mowers actually kill them. It's just that they're removing all the cover and shelter that they used to have. And uh, um, they're easy pickings for um, predators like the kites. The other one which I missed off the list um, is, is hares and particularly leverets because hares will run away, but the leverets will just cower down when you go with a mower and um, you have got to be absolutely on it to spot them. We will, you know, wherever we can, we'll stop them, get off, move the leveret out um, into a safe bit. You go past with the mower and you look back and you see the leverets then just skip back in and it's hiding in the next time round. So you have to make a mental note, where's the leveret next time? And you have to go and move it. So, uh, but it is really difficult. I don't know if you can see the the, the length of the sward there, um, you know, from, from the tractor, but that's quite a dense crop. It's not just grass. We, um, we're an organic farm. There's about 40% of that is red clover. There's also um, uh, chicory herbs, that sort of thing within the mix. And it's, it's a very dense um, canopy that you're trying to look into to, to, you know, make sure you don't damage things. Next slide, please. So the, the economics that shape farming, um, a sort of a mixture of things and and we're sort of moving into an area now where I, I think the levers for change potentially lie um we've got farms out there we've got that the are able to draw on private capital and and if we look at things like net farm i mean they're wonderful examples of what is possible you know what is possible if you have got the resources behind you and to me that sort of they're great beacon farms about um you know where we could go there's public capital um which is the government intervention and it was really encouraging to hear us say you know that engagement with um you know with defra and with natural england about how public capital can be uh, channeled into um delivering change particularly through the environmental schemes and the you know the um, the justification for public capital is where there is market failure. They step into those areas where 
costs where the costs of production are being externalized and by costs the impact on the environment and on uh, wildlife is certainly one of those costs that at the moment isn't fully reflected and the last one is is sort of through markets um, with the organic market that we're working in obviously there are premiums um, that are attributed to particular ways of farming and that really is you know that enables us to make the change a lot of the changes that we have and that was some of the thinking behind the pasture fed livestock association that if we could start to embody some of the expectations of customers within a you know a clearly defined set of standards and a production method then hopefully um you know people would be able to exercise um, choices when they go to do their shopping and support those schemes. And we, the process has to start somewhere. We felt that it was really important to get that as a, an option for all people, getting the message across about how important it is to support these schemes and to say, yes, it does matter, um, has been a far harder part of the process. I think there is a dedicated core there, um, but we you know, quickly need to move beyond that um, and make this, we would like to get to a point where pasture fed livestock is the default within the UK. Now that is the ambition, um, but we've got a long way to go from where we are at the moment. Um, next slide, please. Environmental schemes, which um, was, um, touched on very quickly um, they've got a history going back to 1991 um, we joined I think our first countryside stewardship in, in 2003 and by, by that time they were reasonably well developed um, that ran for 10 years we went then into environmental stewardship and there's quite a lot of overlap between these these various schemes because they've all got a a life of either five or ten years as a commitment so as one particular scheme is coming to the end the next scheme is usually um you know setting off and you you hopefully will move from one scheme to another and we're currently towards the end of a an entry level and higher level scheme and we have also got a couple of small schemes in countryside stewardship the second iteration of countryside stewardship um, which came in in 2014 and you will probably have heard that you know quite a lot recently that um, the environmental land management or ELM schemes have now finally um, got off the ground after a, um, quite a uh, delayed start but all of them even though they're different schemes the actual elements within the scheme uh, they are they basically represent um, a, a whole range of options for farmers which you can then put together um, in a way that actually um, fits your farm very well it fits the attributes of your farm your expectations and what you're trying to achieve and with certainly within these there is scope for targeting species could i have the next slide thank you so this is the one that i actually pulled out from curlews um, from the existing one so if i wanted to Take a look at, you know, if I wanted to enhance the habitat for curlews on my farm, um, the one on the left, the, 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 the columns I've put on the left are actually uh, both from the RSPB. So the top one, curlews breed in a range of habitats, but primarily favour you know, rough grasslands, moorlands and bogs, which, uh, of course, you know, echoes very much what Mike and Russ have said about where the distribution is around the UK, where the pressure spots are. The options for us, are the ones on the right, so AB5 is our environmental scheme option, uh, nesting plots for, uh, you know, higher tier stone curlew, um, where you find it, arable land, temporary grassland. So there's, a, there's, a, there's automatically a mismatch there between the rough grasslands, moorlands and bogs, which is, you know, where we know the habitat is, to the areas that they're trying to target with the funding, to the, to the point where if we have got permanent pasture and we felt that that was useful for curlews, it wouldn't be eligible for funding. 
similarly, the second one, which is, you know, decline numbers and you, you're looking at the areas, the North Staffordshire area, um, those areas that, that sort of Mike outlined in his uh, introduction there. There's an SB9, there's a, there's a supplement that we can put in for, for curlews. And if you look at the counties where that is, and these are very hard boundaries, if you're one mile outside of, um, you know, a, a Cambridgeshire or Norfolk or something like that, you're not going to get funding. And out of that list, there's really only sort of Norfolk that I recognise. Um, I mean, my... my I have to put my hands up. My knowledge of curlews is is um, is very very basic, but out of that list, they're not the areas that um, you know reflect the ones that I feel are probably most under pressure. So there's a lot of what I'm saying is there are opportunities there, but there clearly is scope for fine tuning them um, to to deliver much better outcomes. The pots of money are there, the structures are there. This is public money. And there is a good case for using it in a far more targeted way. So next uh, slide, please. So pasture fly very, very quickly, um, which is the, um, the the label now for, that, that embraces a um, uh, set of production standards. We've got 900 members. There's 150 certified farms covering nearly 27,000 hectares. And that is a big area of farmland. All of the farmers involved in it are very um, you know, engaged with their customer base and they want to do the right thing. And I think if there is any scope at all for um, sort of collaborative work to be done uh, in Curlew Action, I would, yeah, the, there's basically an open door there. Let's see what we can do. I sit on the um, standards committee. Um, we review the standards from year to year. And there again, if there's scope for anything that we, we feel um, is practical for farmers, uh, we, we can start to um, you know, embody that within the production standards. And could we have the last slides, please? So enabling change, um, this I suppose is a very personal um, perspective which only reflects our farm, but collaboration is a great thing. The, the two people, Pete and Jackie Murray, that we've got that little picture of, they're retired teachers, they're both very keen botanists and ornithologists. We work with them, they are our Grange Rangers. On a daily basis, they will go around the farm They and you know, I, I sit there and I'm stuck in the office for an awful lot of the day. So I, I rely on knowing what's going on on the farm from people like Pete and Jackie. And they're a great resource. You know, they will tell me where the species are, where the habitats are. And when we're doing any environmental work on the farm, we always go to them and say, look, what can we do? Where do we need to be doing it? And they are part of the team now. So I'm sure similarly, other farms around the country, there are partnerships to be made with um, people, particularly, you know, in areas where there are curlews and you've got volunteers who can identify where nests are, raise awareness. That collaboration with farmers, um, don't underestimate uh, or overestimate the amount of time that we have to actually go out, spend the time looking for where nests are and understanding what's going on. Um, we are time poor, unfortunately. Um, as I say, no, and Russ said as well, no two farms are alike. We need bespoke solutions that actually, um, you know, are tailored to each particular farm. Are we looking at the, pro the problems correctly? Are the solutions practical? Are they viable? Um, and, you know, all the, everything I've heard from what Curly Action are doing is, is reflecting that, that sort of approach. Um, but in the successful working module, it was great to hear that there are pilots out there, examples, because having solutions that are practical, relevant and achievable is the key to unlocking, um, you know, access to things like these environmental schemes. They need pilots. They need to know that if money is going to be applied in a certain way, you're going to get the outcomes that are um, you know, expected of it. And that's certainly the case with silage. Um, could we have the next um, slide, please? Oh, there's one missing. <laughs> there, is a, there is a missing slide and there's two versions of this. So I'm going to have to just wing this one. But um, in terms of 
in terms of our own farm, if someone would say, look, we, we would love to try and encourage curlews onto the farm. I don't think I've ever known for curlews on the farm, but it's relevant for snipe. And we've certainly got snipe um, starting to come back. There's habitat, there's food sources, um, there's things like predators. And we, we've got a farm, we have got the probably one of the biggest populations of badgers of any farms in the area, which, you know, we find ways to accommodate them. We support them wherever they can. But in terms of uh, curlews, obviously, uh, and, and ground nesting birds, that's not great. We've got a fantastic uh, population of foxes as well. We've got magpies. We've got, you know, the red kites you've seen. There's all sorts of predators out there. And we would, you know, we need to understand that it isn't just one thing. It isn't just about us modifying the way we cut silage. It is about habitat creation. It's about managing predators. And all those all those have to work for um, us to actually have the outcomes that we would be looking for in terms of uh, increasing populations. I've spoken for far too long. Sorry about that, Mike, um, but hand it back to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. That, that's really good to have a farming farmer's perspective, but far too often it, 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 it's all us curlew maniacs go, going on about just from the curlew point of view and not looking at the practical farmer's point of view. Before we go to Mandy, I wonder if I could just ask uh, Russ if he'd like to comment on the mismatch which John pointed out between um, the uh, desirability of uh, environmental measures supported by government and the um, and the actual possibility uh, is is that I'm, I'm sure that's something familiar to you Could, would you like to expand on that briefly before Mandy speaks yeah I mean I think yeah it's fair to say for from anyone's perspective that trying to wade your way through the current raft of environmental um uh, measures uh, being proposed by DEFRA is extremely difficult and obviously they're different in different countries of the UK and Ireland as well which which doesn't help um I mean, it's worth saying that their stone curlew and Eurasian curlew are different species so so the supplements are available at the moment for stone curlew not necessarily available for curlew our understanding is that under the new countryside stewardship plus there are going to be suitable options for um for for curlew I think just stepping back from it, my main concern with the current schemes is that, you know, as you heard from me and you'll probably hear from Mandy in a minute, um, you know, curlew need a range of options to be productive in lowland farmed landscapes. And at the moment, an individual farmer or even a farmer cluster have to pick and choose a whole range of options across several schemes in a way that is not coherent. Uh, I'd much rather see schemes that are devolved down to the landscape scale, the farmer cluster scale, where then those decisions can be made in a flexible way within that landscape. Whereas at the minute, you know, you've got to grab this option around delayed cutting from here or a bit of habitat creation from here. Predator management might only be available under a higher tier CS scheme, for instance, nest fencing or some lethal control in the future if that gets included. And that's not going to be very attractive to, to people, you know, for so, so we need a wider range of species, including curlew and other breeding waders that are provided in packages. But I do think the easiest way to do that is to devolve a lot of the decision making down to farmer cluster type scale, where it would be much more effective, I think. Uh, thanks very much, Russ. I'm sure we'll want to come back to to, to this discussion. It's, it's the crucial one. How, how can we persuade the government to fund farmers to not merely uh, produce uh, desirable food, but to look after curlews and other ground nesting species as well. That that's that's the key long term question for us. Anyway, let me invite Mandy to uh, to talk about her wonderful curlew country project. Mandy, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm just going to share. Hope 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 you get to see this. Can you see that, everyone? Yeah. Good. Great, thanks. Um, so just before I start, just because I'll get to the end and I'll forget to say, but I um, totally agree with what Rice, Russ has just said. And I think that there are so many opportunities about there, but I hope I'm actually just going to elaborate a little bit on why it's so complicated to find the ideal for curlew. And not only is it complicated, but I think it's going to be a journey because I think that 
the main conservation organisations would agree that they realised about the plight of curly rather too late and we're trying to turn around a really serious situation now. Russ has outlined it and Graham Appleton's um, put it in, in very user-friendly terms in terms of the numbers of chicks that we need to recruit. And I think it's going to be a staged process. And of course, everyone likes simplicity, both farmers and policy makers alike. But I think it's going to be a journey and I think we've got to be brave enough and creative enough to go on that journey. But I'll say a bit more later. So sorry, everyone, I'm Amanda Perkins from Curly Country. And um, as I'm last, there will be some things that are doubling up. So I'll try and whiz through them as I go along. Curly Country started out as one of 15 projects in a landscape partnership scheme. Um, and it was then hosted by Shropshire Hills AOMB, but it's now hosted by um, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Oh, I'm not moving on. Hang on. Sorry, I seem to have frozen. What's happened here? Ah, sorry, everyone. I've frozen and I don't know why I'm not moving on. Just check it out. Um, right. Good. On, on we go. Um, so our area, which was part of the Landscape Partnership Scheme area, was um, a, a big area of, of 200 kilometres square. But of course, curlies don't understand the, understand the boundaries. We're rather unusual for an initiative in that we go over the border into Montgomeryshire. And indeed, we've just um, sort of agreed to to take on a bigger area of Mon the whole of Montgomeryshire to look at um, the uh, contiguous population of curly that we have. We're in a hot spot of about 40 to 50 pairs. And we're in a sort of slightly complicated landscape because um, although we're considered to be lowland, we are we are um, hill country in places, although we've got three river valleys and quite a lot of our farms are generally small. They're predominantly beef and sheep, so pastoral. And they're they um, and so with some dairy, I should, should mention as well. So but we've got quite a lot of land in the less favoured area, which is a designation where you have poor soil and it means that you the what you can actually farm in in terms of cropping is is limited so it's it's really often limited to pastoral activity um we've been active since uh, 2015 um i talked about how we started off but when we but it's worth mentioning that before the landscape partnership scheme came into being the rural community um, was consulted what would you want to do if you if you were given some money for conservation what would you want to do and 98 percent of those who could vote voted for a curly recovery project so that's how keen people were to try and see curlies returning to their landscape in in numbers we had a very limited budget thirteen thousand pounds over five years and six six hours a week of of, of staff time and the staff happened happened to be me um, and my job really was to go to farmers and ask them uh, if they would uh, work with us on curlew and improve their habitat um, to make things better for breeding curlew. And the farmers understandably said, actually, we're pretty fed up with people telling us what to do. And, um, you know, if 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 some of us have done habitat work and it's not working and we know that predation is a problem and we're not going to work with you unless you guys take predation control seriously. So we went back to the drawing board, as it were, and we redesigned the project to work in partnership with farmers and focus on the reasons for failure. Um, to recruit into the local population. So without making a judgment that it was habitat or that it was something that people were doing wrong or whatever, we said, look, let's just go back to basis, basics and find out what's really going on here. Now, each year we we monitor um, just over, uh, um, well, we, we, we monitor about around 20 nests, but because as Russ has mentioned, curlews, although they're territory faithful, they go, they travel over quite large um, areas, so we're working with different people. We 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 have an office pair of curlew, and it had it can nest on fields in in many different ownerships or management. So we've got to razz around the place and work with new people, and hence we add people onto our list every year. Um, we 
started in between 2015 and 2017, we carried out field trials to establish why the curlews were failing to breed successfully. Um, we were fairly sure because we could see them in their territories um, that habitat was plentiful. And our ornithologist, Tony Cross, would call this a curlew uh, golloping down a worm, which is exactly what we want to see. Although I have to say that since we started um, eight years ago, whenever it was, We've seen uh, a lot of drainage of habitat um, since then, extraordinary every year, more and more. And so that foraging habitat must be diminishing as well. What did we do? Well, we went out and we found nests and we monitored them. We put cameras up on nests and we put data loggers up on nests. And if we got any chicks, which I'll talk about in a minute, we put radio tags on them and we tracked them. No chicks survived to fledge from any of the nests that we monitored um, in the two year period, 2015 and 2016. And each year we only had three nests which um, uh, where chicks hatch from uh, from the eggs um, and all the others were predated at egg stage. The causes of nest failure in those two years combined from, from the 25 nests were predation, just over 50% by foxes, just under 25% by badgers. Um, one was a sheep <laughs> um, caught on camera. Um, crows, which are a problem for other people, haven't to date been so much of a problem in our area. Um, some were probably abandoned or um, some and, and some we just didn't didn't know what the cause was. We just hadn't got the evidence to um, to be sure. But anecdotally, we had observed that nests that had that had the nest not failed due to predation, they would have most likely been accidentally. And I say accidentally because farmers, uh, I, I know very few farmers that aren't very keen on curlews um, and they don't want to harm them but they're very difficult to see in a field a, a, a curly will hear a, a tractor coming to up to a gate and perhaps someone getting out of the cab and opening the gate and it'll be off it'll be off the nest and a farmer won't ever have seen it or know that the nest is there um, so in our area as i've said this is actually our, our dairy farm um, and you can see that little green area in the middle there is actually an area that they've left because we've fenced around um, a nest. But you can see that um, around it, everywhere is shorn. And as John talked about, when you when you cut like this, it, it attracts many avian predators in. Um, and so those poor curlews are really under threat, um, just keeping their nest safe when all of that activity is happening around them. Most people think that uh, the sort of habitat that curlews nest in is this sort of habitat. This is this is habitat in our area, um, and um, the the grass on on the left hand side is um, what you might find in more upland areas. And we do have quite a lot of rushy uh, lowland pasture like that on the right in in on 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 the right hand side. Sorry, and whilst the birds are, are territory faithful. Um, they're not actually choosing those areas. They're choosing this sort of area. They're choosing, as Russ said, something that they can see out over the top of, but they can also hunker down in and hide. That ryegrass is, is, has, has grown a bit further on. But because um, our farms are fairly well grazed and um, farmers are under pressure to, to really manage them, you've got uh, areas that are quite that have quite a short sward the rye grass which grows very quickly gets away and the stock have shut out of it so that um they can so that the silage can grow and what and and that's what curly seem to be choosing sadly around all around the place so uh sorry i'll go back um what what are uh curlies are choosing um so again, just over 50% silage and haylage, um, a bit of hay meadow, a bit of semi-improved rush, rush pasture, and some unimproved grass. And we haven't we haven't got lots of it, but mainly silage. And uh, whilst we're really talking about 
silage cropping here, uh, there can be difficulties earlier on. Um, you can see at the top, our, our silage gets, um, our, our silage crops and our haylage crops get uh, rolled, they get fertilized. So that this, this slide at the bottom, you might be able to see that there's actually um, a, a tire track there. And very sadly, that nest was abandoned. So someone had been in, they'd fertilized this field. They didn't know the nest was there, that it was just saved from being destroyed by a tire. But by the time we got there, which was not very long after it had happened, um, the curlew was not coming back to the nest. Um, we saw it go to the nest and look at it. We retreated. Um, we came back uh, later to see if it was there, but it, 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 it wasn't. It was very nervous when we were there and it had sadly abandoned the nest. Um, so a fence would Actually, we were we were told about Natalie Meyer in Germany, who was trialing temporary electric fencing around curlew nests. Now, curlews um, nest territorially, so they're they're not. You will have seen colonial um, fences uh, uh, or colonial uh, type fencing around nests on programs such as Spring Watch and so on, where birds nest together. It's easy to put a fence up around several nests, but this is individual fences up around individual nests. Um, and we were told about that and we thought we'd give it a go um, because we were fairly desperate by then, having had no chicks in those first two years. And in 2016, in that second year, when we trialled these fences, the uh, nests got beyond egg stage to actually hatch chicks. So we knew that that would, we had an inkling that that was going to improve things dramatically. Uh, we actually use five strands now of, uh, of electric wire, but um, it, that will keep livestock out. It will stop. The, it will alert the farmer to knowing where the nest is, and it will keep all but the most determined mammals out. So, in two thousand and seventeen, we focused on aiming to enable chicks to fledge successfully. We fenced as many nests as possible. We trialled predation control in um, three areas. And in those same areas, we work with a farm business manager to assess the real cost to a farm business when a farmer delays cutting a crop to protect curlies. Um, and this is what we got. <laughs> and this bird at the back here is uh, a curly chick. Uh, it's uh, very close to being fully fledged. And so from those three areas, we got a minimum of three chicks. It's very difficult to know how many chicks actually become fully fledged because um, unless you actually see them depart, you're not sure what happens to them. We had uh, two chicks that had uh, from a clutch that went on um, until both adults had left. So the female leap departs before the rest of the family and then the male leaves and the chicks leave. Afterwards, we, know, we knew that the male had gone. We were watching them um, very carefully. That's the male at the front there. It's not, it wasn't this uh, clutch of chicks. And um, on uh, the following day, we found one of the chicks predated. Um, so we are fairly sure that we only got one away from that clutch, but that's just how difficult it is to um, know that that um, these birds have got away. And you can see this is a, a large field. Sorry, um, clicking on uh, using my clicker. Uh, this is a large field um, that has has now been cut for silage and very limited cover for for that for those remaining birds. All the fields around it will have been cut as well or most likely to have been cut as, as well. And um, thank goodness they're ready to go. And, and we think that one got away, the male left, and then the chick followed. So what did we have to do um, when we prevented that chick um, from being harvested along with the rest of the crop? So two of us um, spent uh, daylight hours Really well, we spent several days before trying to work out where the birds were and what their movements were. Um, we and those that the pairs in that area actually travelled over a huge distance. So um, we've we've seen them covering about a hundred acres, um, probably in search for 
good food and uh, uh, plentiful invertebrates for the chicks, but probably places where the adults can feed as well. Um, and then on the day of harvesting, of, 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 of mowing the silage crop, uh, we had two people watching uh, throughout the whole process and, and um, coming back actually during daylight hours to try and establish where um, those birds were. And in the end, we had to leave an area of about 10 acres uncut because on the right hand side, you can see a curlew swooping low over the crop. And what happens, um, John talked about hares hunkering down and the juvenile chicks hunker down as well. And the adults will try and disperse them. So they'll try and sort of, um, in the law of averages, save their chicks so that they're not all together to be picked off by the potential threat. Um, and they will at the same time be trying to lure you, the threat, away from where those chicks are. So trying to actually find them it, it is a long and complicated process. Um, they do fly low and they do call to the chicks. And if you get your eye and your ear in for long enough, you can get a good idea of where you're seeing them do that. But as I've said, they'll disperse the chicks. So you've got chicks in different areas and adults calling to chicks in different areas. And it's really difficult to try and establish exactly where they are and get it down to a small area. We have got it down to a small area. We have sort of halved that area in another in another case. Um, what we couldn't do, um, and every year I I get lots of phone calls from distressed farmers saying, oh, I've come to the field to, to, to harvest it, and all the contractors are in, and we've seen a curlew fly up, and can, please can you tell me how to rescue it? Can I go in and find the chicks? Well, Tony is there with his radio tra transmitter, and you can imagine that um, a, a small bird, actually, even even the birds near to fully fledging are very light and, and quite slender birds. You will have seen that the, the bird we were looking at, um, the juvenile, is, is, is still smaller. You can see it looks sort of taller and thinner than the male on the left hand side there. Um, and a farmer doesn't want his crop trampled. I mean, how, where would you find it? It's a needle in a haystack situation. So. Um, we don't go in and try and rescue the family from the field unless we're absolutely sure where they are. We have done it. We've done it uh, um, on another field, but it's pretty difficult to do. And again, <laughs> that took three of us the best part of a, a day to do and a lot of running around and um, a lot of uh in that in that case, a lot of concern from a, a, a curly friendly farmer, but contractors who were um, sighing and chomping at the bit to get on with things. What did the farmer have to do to enable those chicks to survive? So um, in that case, lose 10 acres of crop at best nutritional value, um, pay the contractor to return to a second time to cut the crop that that um, they could that couldn't be cut the first time around, and that will have been at a much lower quality uh, uh, than the first cut. And in some cases, we work with farmers where the crop is lost altogether. It's, it's not really going to be um, worth anything or, or suitable for feeding to stock. Um, they've lost the cost that had gone into growing that crop. They had the cost of replacing the silage. Um, and Sadly, if you're buying silage in, it's it's obviously going it, it's often going to be cost more than producing it yourself. Um, and in that case, they had to make other arrangements for the cattle that they planned to move onto the field to graze the aftermath. So they've got cattle waiting to come onto that field once the new grass growth came through and they couldn't come onto the field. They had to wait. Um, we had, I, I just shown this slide again, this is actually back on our dairy farm, so that's not on that field, um, but we had tried to uh, mow across the field. Now, um, people conserving corn crakes developed a method where they go into the middle of the field and they sort of spiral out. Um, and the idea is that they've got the least chance of, of getting uh, the corn crakes in the middle of the field and they'll drive them out of the field. But we've talked about um, curlies hunkering down and we've talked about the fact that they need cover to move into. Um, and 
the, the adjacent fields are off, have often been mown, as I said, and if they haven't been mown, they're not, they've often been very tightly grazed. So um, you can see how vulnerable they are. This, this has been cut, this little nest area has been lost and actually vulnerable because any of you who have dogs will know that if you had a dog and it saw that longer grass surrounded by shorter grass, that's the first place that it would be nipping in to see if there was anything hiding in there. So why don't farmers want to save curlews? This is something that I'm asked quite a lot by people who phone up and they they, they can phone up particularly being distressed, as I've said, about uh, silaging or other cropping activity going on. Well, most farmers do want to save curlew um, and they want to engage with that, but few can afford to sacrifice income to support breeding curlew adequately. Um, and Russ has talked about the amount of land um, that, that, that curlews are on and where our lowland curlews are, mainly all on farmland and mainly all on these small farms that we've been talking about. And here's Winford, um, a farming partner. What, he didn't want anything to do with us when we first met, but he's a great partner now. Um, he's very keen on his curlews. And he's so keen that for two years in a row, uh, he sacrificed half of a field's crop to try and save a curly family. But after two years, he was unable to bear that financial hit any longer. Um, and he's understandably disgruntled and distressed that there's not a lot he can do really to try and help these birds. He needs a good agri-environment scheme and he needs predation control. And those things aren't currently on the table, sadly. And why is it so difficult for these small lowland um, and upland farmers? Well, this is a 21, uh, 2021 table of farm incomes and with various different types of farms on here. But here we are, lowland grazing livestock. That's um, the income over that period. You can see it's it's the lowest that there is and not too dissimilar. Um, next in line for upland livestock. So these guys are really up against it. And this is um, a table showing uh, the amount of direct payments to farmers. Now, the direct payments to farmers um, because of elms are changing um, and farmers are having that reduced over a period of time. Um, and they they are being told that the ELMS schemes will provide opportunities for them to um, go into more nature friendly farming, um, increasing biodiversity, other environmental um, measures which amount to natural capital. But they're not in place yet and the farmers are losing income in the meantime. And you can see here, this is a, a DEFRA forecast um, that um, livestock farms in less favoured areas, the average income is expected to fall by two thirds to £16,000. And these guys have all the costs that John was talking about. So they're not, they, they're not, when people phone me up and, uh, and say, oh, why don't these farmers love their curlew? It's, it's too stark a choice. These guys are living on the edge and they just can't, however much they love a curlew, they can't. They can't lose income. They can't. They haven't got anywhere. They haven't got any any slack in the system. So should we get people have said, you know, what 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 would you, what should we do? We've said we the AES schemes aren't there yet. They're not meeting our need. Um, and we've all we all think that actually this is an amazing opportunity. We we hope that this is an amazing opportunity for Elms to provide for curlew, but I spoke a little bit at the beginning about how complicated that is. And I've talked about the finances, I've talked about um, the problems that, that farmers face when dealing with silage and that curlews face too. But I think there's another thing here, this charismatic species is one that farmers engage with. And um, there are lots of other, anyone who knows curlew um, tends tend to be very engaged by them. 
And with our farmers, we formed a farmers group and it inspired them really quickly. We worked with them in lots of workshops and it inspired them to work uh, to think more widely about other environmental considerations in a way that perhaps other species don't don't always do. And uh, for, for, for we compiled this uh, table here really to look at the multiple benefits that might accrue from 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 centering out from those curlews in the middle and everything that they could deliver. So this flagship keystone species <laughs> provides another opportunity. It's a sort of sandwich, really. It's it, it's a it's a, a, a policy where it's conventional in terms of um, delivering what is needed through agri environment schemes, but it's also an opportunity not to be missed because farmers aren't always first in line to engage with these things, but they do engage with curlew. And it really is my belief that we, we've we got to bite the bullet now, we've got to get it right now. Um, but sadly, we haven't got it right yet. There's nothing much on the table for curlew. John spoke about that, how, about how in different areas there are different uh, prescriptions and so on, and they don't always meet the needs of what's available on the ground. Russ has talked about the fact that the Curly Recovery Partnership are working really hard on this. Um, and I have talked about the fact that I think it's going to be a journey. I think it's going to be a stage um, where we need to work in clusters and perhaps can come to a solution where um, we have pieces of ground that are delivering all these benefits that I've got in the diagram on the left hand side and which can be available to individual farmers and enable um, curlews to spread out to increase their range and repopulate our farmland in the way that people remember um, rather sentimentally perhaps the, the landscapes, those wilder landscapes of their youth, the, far, the, the uh, older farmers I speak to talk about this very eloquently and um, very fondly and they want to see that back. They're under pressure to deliver, they're under and we must all take responsibility for that because we have uh, we've collaborated with this pressure for cheap food and more choice. Sorry, um, I'm coming to the end. That's the end. I didn't hear what that that was. But coming to the end. So that I will end there. I will end there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mandy. Um, Ellen, are, are there any particular questions that um, that have cropped up that you think we should should answer? Yes. Yeah. So we've only got about um, seven minutes for questions. So any questions that we don't uh, manage to answer, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please just email me and I will send them around to the speakers. Um, so the first question was, and I'm going to paraphrase it slightly. Um, Matthew says, John, loved your presentation. What are your thoughts about holistic grazing practices, daily livestock moves, uh, back fencing, etc.? Oh, this is sort of mob grazing, I think, is the um, a sort of colloquial term for it. But it it mimics the natural patterns of um, cattle, which are. I suppose, you know, be, be nomadic patterns where they graze, move on, graze, move on. Um, and there's, there's a huge number of benefits that come from that because during that sort of recovery phase, the, the cattle are leaving their dung there, that supports the insects, but the cattle have moved on. Um, and ironically, actually, people who practice this, the productivity of the grassland is actually a lot higher than in the most, you know, sort of more intensive uh, ways, uh, patterns that we've sort of have evolved over the last 40 years. Um, so there are some fantastic practices that are coming out of Pasture for Life. Um, and uh, as I say, it's counterintuitive, but by dialing back the intensity, you can actually increase pro productivity, you can increase the uh, profitability of farms, which is the, you know, the really important thing. Um, I, I just wish that um, you know, it, it was better well known. I, you know, in the next five, 10 years, if pasture for life can become a lot more mainstream, I think we'll see huge benefits from that. Thanks, John. Any other questions you want to raise, Ellen? Um, and I would say I'd like to leave a couple of minutes at the end to give Mary uh, Colwell uh, a chance to, to say, uh, fill in any gaps that she thinks are, are missing. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so there was one quick question. Uh, I've now lost it in the chat um, about the size of fencing. That's quite a quick one to answer. Uh, either Mandy or Russ. Sorry, the size meters. of fencing around the nest. 20, 20 metres. <laughs> um, 10 metre centres. Great, thank you. Um, and in a silage dominated habitat, did the chicks travel far from the nest to where they fledged? Or was there was there enough suitable food locally? Um, there is um, in silage. Uh, Russ has said that they often find it hard actually to move through the silage. So some of them can just be, uh, you know, lost uh, trying to get out and trying to get food. But they tend to no, they tend to move. Well, they will move away from where they nested anyway. That's a that's a sort of lure, you know, taking chicks away from 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 predators finding the nest thing. But um, they will. But they tend to the the juvenile I or the young chick I showed you with the with the male, that 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 curly family was was seen over uh, traveling over a hundred acres. Yeah, I'd, I'd support that. We in, in our observations, uh, we've uh, in in hay meadows, we found they wander all over all over the place and go through astonishing obstacles too, through really deep ditches, <laughs> which would have thought would be much too difficult for tiny chicks to go through, and you find them going from one one field to a, to another. Anything else, Ellen? Um. Well, Mary uh, has asked me. The questions um to put to our speakers and she'd like each speaker to kind of uh round up by asking can we have curlews and this level of silage uh so russ we'll start with you uh that's a question and a half i think the um this has got to be through the whole chain so there's got to be consumer awareness and and, and so to some extent yeah there's got to be greater enthusiasm from the consumer side um, to look at a different way of, of achieving this. Um, and that will pull through then to the farmers. At the moment, it's a system that's not working uh, and we need to look at all parts of the system. The farmers can do their bit, um, but ultimately, if consumers want food at the price that they're getting it at the minute, uh, there's going to be an environmental cost, as John eloquently said. And so we need to look at this through the whole chain. We can do the front end, but we're going to have to do the back end. And that's why, as Mandy said, it's going to be a long game. Same question to Mandy. Um, I actually favour um, the, the model that I showed at the end, which is that we need to know if we provide the right circumstances for curlew if they'll return and we do see this in more upland areas where we've got predation control going on and we've got habitat that's better suited to their needs and we find that the curlews families don't travel quite so far um, and I think that delivering all those multiple other multiple benefits would be fantastic as well. And it will make it will make things simpler for policymakers and for farmers. And, and the problem with AES is that everyone wants it to be simple. And we've just said that curlies aren't simple. So I think we need to go to the cluster model. We need to do the research that we haven't had the time to research. In, and in the meantime, we use, need to use our best pragmatic means of, 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 of what we're doing to try and save them and, and use the research to move on. And I hope we might get to that model and deliver so many outcomes that it's irresistible. It's a no brainer. John, before I wrap up, can we have curlews and silage? <laughs> Possibly. Um, yeah, I think I, I very much agree. It's got to be a cluster approach. I mean, clearly the time for action is now, you know, it, you've got to get the right outcomes and I wouldn't want to be too prescriptive about it. But if you approach it on a landscape um, uh, model, understand exactly what the problems are. If it is silage, then yes, let's, you know, we've got to tackle that. If it's predators, yes, we've got to tackle that. It is part of the picture. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm always really cautious about putting in uh, pres prescriptive um, solutions without knowing the actual specific circumstances. Thank you very much, John, and thank you all the speakers. And so uh, in conclusion, can I repeat what uh, Ellen said. If anybody has any any queries or afterthoughts, uh, Ellen's put up her 
message or you can send a message straight to the Kolu Action uh, website. And I promise you that I and the others will try and find answers or at least comments on what you say. I think the conclusion is clearly then uh, Curlew Action needs to continue the work of really publicizing the difficulties here and really bringing them to the attention of the authorities and pressing for some action. Uh, so I hope you found this interesting. Uh, we'll close it there, but please keep in touch. And uh, a reminder that Curlew Action is a very small and very impoverished charity and any uh, kind contributions will be most gratefully received. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.